So this is uh, 2902. I'm not going to be doing a lot of writing. I'll write tidbits here and there. Ah, what the hell? So this is EE 2902, week 7, lecture 1. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the um, I squared C interface, okay? Or the audio codec controller, whatever I called it last time. Again, I'm not going to be doing a lot of writing. I'm going to be doing a lot of talking. So um, let's look at Colin Stapleton's project. That's the reference design. OK? Uh, so one thing I want, well, let's just open up his project. Uh, Colin Stapleton was a student in 2002 in spring 2011, I believe. Get started, yes. Okay, so let me just do a quick. Um, oops. Arc. There. Okay. Yeah, there. Project Navic, come on. Pretty Windows, Project Navigator. that let me just do a quick analysis and synthesis and while it's doing that let's take a look at uh, his design so something I just noticed is maybe because of the way I imported it in Quartus first thing is your top level should be the first file right so I'm going to move that so it's clear Okay, and you have to re synthesize it for some insane reason, but here it is. Okay, so again, you should have oops, not the audio, the clock buffer should have been done. All right, and where is the delay counter should have been done? Okay, so if you look at Colin's top level. So what we're going to discuss today is this, the audio codec controller. Again, these two should be done. So if you notice, uh, the audio codec controller has two inputs, right? A 50 megahertz clock coming from the clock buffer, and this reset here coming from your, this is your global reset, remember? Okay, the delay counter reset we'll use for the ADC, DAC controller later, okay, next checkpoint. These are the two inputs. The output is going to be the I squared C clock, the I squared C data line, and then the control line, okay, for the tri-state buffer. Notice Colin infers a tri-state buffer at the top level, okay? So a tri-state buffer is, a uh, functionality is simple. I'll explain the basics behind it. If you want more details, uh, go to my lecture notes and videos. Come on. Uh, lecture notes and videos from 2900, okay? If you go in there, it doesn't matter which section. Uh, here, uh, logic level tri-state buffers. If you look at this lecture video, week nine, lecture three from last quarter, it should be clear what tri-state buffers are if you want more details on it. But tri-state buffer, uh, it's the functionality is very simple. If this line is asserted, that is the data, the control line, okay? So the control line, notice, goes here. If it's asserted that if it's a one, how does the tri-state buffer act? So let's say the output is called Y, the input is called X. So if the control line is 1, what is Y? Huh? X. Yes, so Y is assigned to X. When it's 0, the control line, Y is high impedance, it's floating. And if you notice at the top level, it's exactly what Colin would have done here. Okay? So the data tri state, the data is. So Y is assigned to X when the control line is one, else Y is Z, so it's high impedance, okay? So a couple of points, again, you should go through this lecture 
for more details. Uh, point number one is your FPGA should support tri-state buffers. You know, in the sense that you should be able to understand, like, should have inbuilt like pull-up resistors or uh, for high impedance, okay? And your Cyclone 2 FPGA has that. Not only that, uh, if I remember correctly, if you go to assignments, uh, you can also, let's say you're interfacing to an external device via the GPIO, all right? Via the GPIO that, and the external device is, for example, a common example is an accelerometer, right? That uses the I2C protocol. So you have a pin on the GPIO that you want to use as a tri-state buffer. So let's go into pin planner. So let's say you want to use GPIO 6, okay? There is a way, let's see, IO standard. I forgot how to do this. Low, simple. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Uh, but basically, your GPIO is bidirectional, okay? So you can, there is a way to implement weak pull-up resistor on this. How do you do this? Let me see. Uh, assignments, device. Device and pin options. Uh, let's see. Dual purpose, board trace, pin configuration, active serial, unused pins, dual purpose pins, capacitive loading. Okay, I don't remember, right? Uh, but anyway, we are, we're not going to be dealing with that in this class. We're not interfacing to an external device. Uh, okay, so getting back, that's about it for how you instantiate a tri-state buffer. And you want to do this at the top level, OK? Because synthesizers, they have difficulty, some of them, inferring tri-state buffers when you do it in a sub-level. Because this device here should is supported on the FPG, right? So it's easier for the fitter to infer it properly when it's inferred at the top level. Is that clear? That's why Colin has taken out a control signal in addition to the clock and the data line, right? This is what I recommend you do for your audio codec controller. Okay? All right, so let's go into the audio codec controller and see what he has done. So, the easiest way now, looking into this, as you go in, it's getting more complicated, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up his VHDL file and look at this, uh, the audio codec controller and look at what are all the important, uh, let's see, audio codec controller, what are all the important sub-modules, okay? The first thing is, Colin's using a 50 kilohertz I2C clock. Like I told you, the I2C protocol can take anywhere from 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, or 10 kilohertz to 400 kilohertz, I believe. Just take a look at the protocol. So if you Google search for I2C, I squared C protocol.com. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Oh, well, this is very bad. Looks like it. So let's just go to the wiki. Wait, I'm looking for the official bus specification from Philips. All right, I squared C is from Philips. Oh, let's see. It's got a lot of information here. Uh, uh, NXP, yeah, bus specification. Here it is. This is probably the official documentation. Yeah, it's pretty old, but you can look in here. This, you should use official documentation to figure out what the frequencies are, the range of frequencies. Whatever, it's not a big deal, right? So the first thing you got to do is you got to design a clock frequency and generate a step-down counter that generates 50 kilohertz from your buffered 50 megahertz clock, okay? On the exam, which is next week, right, I'll ask you, so you can see generically, clock divider is a component that you use over and over again. What is another component you use? Buffer is using a PLL, but what's another one? Counter is under a clock divider, yes, so count another one. Seven segment decoder is combinational, sequential. Registers, okay, so those are the kind of questions I'll ask. So on the exam next week, you should be able to do this with your eyes closed, right? It's like, just, I can do clock divider, okay? All right, that's the first thing you gotta do. You gotta design an I squared C clock. So, Huh? 
Oh, good question. Is there a reason why Colin instantiates the 50 kilohertz clock inside the audio codec controller? It's a design choice in the sense that the 50 kilohertz clock is confined only to the I squared C submodule. Yes. So it's a good design choice because this submodule is used only by the audio codec controller. Okay. Notice something else Colin did. For testing, he sends out the 50 kilohertz clock. So what he's probably going to do is he's going to signal tap this and make sure that, I mean, you can model sim it as well. But signal tapping it is kind of, it doesn't really verify timing, but it confirms you at least have the correct period. Okay. But does it answer your question, Connor? You should not, I mean, there's nothing wrong in the sense that your design will work if you do it right and you instantiate this at the top level. But from a design choice, it doesn't make sense to instantiate this at the top level because the only module that uses this is audio codec controller. Yes. So if you look at the top level, it's nice and packaged, right? So if you go back up one level, there's no reason for this 50 kilohertz controller to be here. 50 kilohertz step down counter, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, in the inside of the audio codec controller. It's a good design practice. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, he has some other modules here. So to figure out what this is doing, let's look at his, let's look at the way he implemented his I squared C finite state machine. Okay. So here. So here is a state machine. Okay. So his I squared C FSM has one, two, three, four, five, six states, all right? This is a recommended way you do this, all right? You don't want to have a state for every bit you're sending out, although you could do that. Your FSM will become really big, right? So, The best way to understand this is to actually, he has his uh, documentation in there. Actually, let's see. I think he has a model some simulation. So let's look at his, oops, I don't need this. Uh, uh, uh. So to understand the I squared CFSM, actually, there are two ways. One way is you can keep looking at the RTL viewer and the state machine viewer. So I can look at the state machine viewer, but let me get into the RTL viewer, get into the audio codec controller. And you can see this is in yellow. Yes, there's a state machine in there. Okay. So, and you can see that from reset, he sends the start condition out, uh, sends data, receive acknowledge, prep for stop, and then he has a stop condition. So what is the start condition and the stop condition? Well, for, let's just look at that first. Mm -mm -mm, I don't need this anymore. That information is there in your I squared C. Yeah. Okay, here. So here is a start condition, send data, uh, data, receive acknowledge, and then the stop condition, okay? So what is the start condition looking at this picture? Look at the start and the stop. Yes, exactly. So your FSM is going to pull SDA low when SCL, when your clock is held high. Remember, you're the master. FPG is the master. Okay. What is the stop condition? No. Yes. SDA goes from low to high when SCL is held high. Okay. In the start and the stop conditions, SCL is always held high. The clock line, okay? Whereas you pull the data line from high to low, okay? When your SCL is high for the start condition, and you pull the data line from low to high when the clock is held high for the stop condition, okay? That's it. No ifs or buts. This is the protocol which your Wolfson audio codec expects because it's following the I squared C protocol. Okay. So that's what I talk about here. Uh, 
Actually, the reference design, I, the one I did uses a 20 kilohertz clock. The one Colin did uses a 50 kilohertz clock. I'm just looking at this. So it's up to you what you want to use, okay? Remember, the faster clock you have, the less data you can signal tap, right? Because you're going to be storing it more often. I mean, given the number of signals you're going to signal tap. Okay, or if you don't want to use signal tap, which I don't recommend you do, you could send all these lines to the GPIOs, all right? And then probe, use your logic analyzer to probe them. But then you need a logic analyzer for you to do the debugging. So you have to be in lab. I recommend you just use learn how to use signal tap. It's very useful. Okay. All right. So instead of looking at the RTL viewer, that is the state machine viewer, you get an idea behind it. The conditions are too, um, what's the word? There's a, it's very hard to understand what's going on from here, in my opinion. So let's just look at a simulation. That is Modelson. There's Modelson. So let's look at Collins. Um, simulation folder. Oh, this boots up. So under the simulation folder, what do you notice? What's the thing that jumps to your mind? He has a separate test bench for each of his module. Debug, remember? Debug each module separately. This is what makes Collins, this is what made him so successful. He right? is very patient and he does the right thing. Don't jump. I mean, don't like think. So in other words, make sure each of your sub-modules works properly, number one. Number two, make sure that the interfaces between the sub-modules is clearly defined, okay? Doing this on a piece of paper uh, before you do the design is that's why he was able to do this individually already yeah it's not that difficult if you do it right okay so that's what you should notice so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to look at his audio codec controller test bench right so i'm going to open that in notepad plus plus so i'm just uh, let's look at his do files he probably has a do file for uh, let's see sim audio codec controller dot do I have not looked at a simulation in like two years, okay? But notice how well, very well designed it is. It's like, I mean, you can't get better than this, okay? So I notice also that he stored his, he's backed up his project, I'm just looking at this. So always back up your project, especially if you're working with partners, agree on standard interfaces Okay. In industry, you're going to be working with a team of like 500 people. You can't manage it. Like I said, they'll fire you and they'll find somebody else who can. So be very systematic, very systematic. That is not an excuse for not thinking, but uh, not being systematic is not an excuse for thinking, right? unless you're Albert Einstein. So yeah, we've seen Albert Einstein's desk, just image, Google Im image, I mean, Image search via Google, Albert Einstein, just the day he died, right? It's all like clutter, but that's Einstein, right? CD, um, oops, where did I store this? I think it's on the desktop. Uh, desktop, let's see, C colon. Sorry? Oh, Einstein, yeah. I'm like, well, I thought seven identical outputs in model some word, huh? Okay. All right. Uh, where is it? Users. Let me desktop. Okay, there it is. All right. This is why you don't store it on the desktop. Users. Make sure your path names does not have spaces in it. Uh, new on project. Okay. In there, simulation. I'm going to do what is it? Sim audio codec controller dot do. See what happens. Mm -mm. Where is it? Uh, some error here. Oh, obsolete library format for design unit. Oh man. Okay, so 
there's some error. That's fine. And since I'm using a newer version of model sim, so let's fix that. I'm gonna delete everything. Uh, skip. Okay, so let me just quit model sim. Let's do this again. I'm gonna try recompiling this from scratch. Simulation. Uh, oh, okay. Let's see. We map. I thought I we live work once. Work is unavailable. All right. Let's try this again. Delete the work library. We create work. Yeah. So, there was some issue with the version of model sim, so I deleted the work library and I started it from scratch. And there it is. Is it actually running the simulation? I think it is. Okay, so it's running the simulation. So as it's running, let's look at some data. Okay? All right, so let's look at all the signals. Uh, so here's the 50 megahertz clock. So you can notice that, let's see, the way he has done this is, so at the test bench, let's, unfortunately my screen's not that big. So let's try it, okay, I think this is enough. So let's look at his test bench, okay. So this is a sim.do, so the audio codec controller test bench, all he's testing is obviously the audio codec controller, okay. Notice since model sim, I mean, I already done this, you can instantiate the clock buffer, although it's a face lock loop, model sim does have the libraries. Is that clear? Instantiates the clock buffer. You don't have to instantiate the delay counter because that's used only in checkpoint two. Is that clear? That's, and well, that's all he's doing, right? Doing the 50 megahertz clock, temporary reset and boom, that's it, okay? He's doing some clock count, I don't know why, but for something he, he must have wanted to do. Right. Okay, but as simulating, let's look at his FSM, right? So this is your, he's looking at what is I squared C state, okay? So here is the start condition, and you can notice that the I squared C data, I'm looking at it at the top level, okay? This is the line that is going out to your audio codec is held high. No, shoot. The the clock line is always held high. Always. Okay. Mistake, mistake. The data is pulled from high to low. Let's check that. Yeah. Data is pulled high to low. Clock is always held high. Okay. So he has a state called start condition. Then he's sending the data, right? Hopefully your computer monitor is bigger than my tablet screen. Okay. You can see. Oh, let me zoom out. Let's see. Send data. Acknowledge. Send data. Acknowledge. Send data. Hmm. What I should see on here, let's see. I should see the bits going out, but I'm not. Mm, 
one squared c d uh, current data bit here it is three, three current data word zero one hmm. all right i gotta look through his documentation as to why i'm not seeing data go out here but anyway so his fsm has a start condition send data wait for acknowledge all right send data wait for acknowledge so it's the address remember 30 well here address okay and then your data and the data is broken up into 16 bits yes two eight bit packets is that clear okay so how is Colin sending I mean where is Colin storing the data and this is um, another tip all right so let's get in to audio codec controller uh, uh, let's see where is it okay so what he has is a ROM a read-only memory storing codec initialization data 10 words 24 bits each okay why is it 24 bits well if you go back to your project folder I told you I have this initialization data so this is the data you're gonna put in your ROM okay so the first eight bits are going to be 0x34 because CSB is tied to ground right so notice you always send 0x34 first for every data packet okay and then you send the specific register address all right and then the data is that clear please read the spec right it's in here all right hopefully it's, i don't know what page it's going to open up but if you look at the i squared c documentation uh, let's see where is it software control interface so read address eight bits of data eight bits of data and this is what I meant here. So the first eight bits are the address and then the actual data. Yes. So 16 bits here, along with 0x34, is it big Indian or little Indian? Big Indian, right? You can't forget this. Like, like Connor is like just boom, big Indian, big Indian, all right? Is that clear? Let me go back here. Okay, actually, let me open this. Let me do this. Open it. So if you look at this, register zero, uh, this is how I've configured it, disabled simultaneous load, disable mute, left line in is high, and this is the data that has to be sent out, okay? And if you convert this to binary, this is an hexadecimal, again, 0x34 is standard, because that's the address of your Wolfson audio codec. Remember we found this from the user's manual, okay? the least significant 16 bits okay actually let's see it's it's not 16 bits only yeah it is well it is 16 bits so it's, it's these address bits okay and then this configuration bits notice it's actually nine bits okay seven bits of address nine bits of data is that clear that's buried in here okay actually oops buried in here it's got to be 16 bits yes you see what i'm saying right the total is 16 bits which is right here and this contains the register address and the data you want to send out so what you should do now is the first step is to understand this why does this translate into this okay no, i'll just look at the register mapping line in uh, LRN, LN in mute, line in volume, okay, yeah. What receiver? That's the codec, the codec will take care of it, the hardware codec. So as long as you stick to this protocol, as long as you stick to this protocol, the receiver will know, oh wait, I'm 0x, I mean the audio codec, the chip will know I'm 0x34, so the master is talking to me, and this is the data that's coming in. 
oh i know what address this is this is what i have to send so the codec knows that okay that's why you follow this data sheet okay so you have uh, let's see 0 through 10 actually this is reset i'm sorry so you don't look at r15 0 through 9 10 registers you have to set okay and if you look at Collins comments 10 words 24 bits each okay so why is it 24 bits well 1 2 3 4 5 6 hex digits 4 bits per hex digit 24 bits is that clear so what Colin did, and this is what I recommend you do, is he designed the next component. First component is the 50 kilohertz clock. You need to design, okay? Next component, a ROM controller that counts out the data bits, okay? So what comes into the ROM controller is when to increment. This comes from your FSM, all right? So in other words, your uh, audio codec controller is going to have in its data path a 50 kilohertz step down counter, a ROM controller, a read only What does ROM stand for? Read only memory, okay? It's gonna have a ROM, I'll show you how to do the ROM. These are all the data path components. And it's gonna have this top level FSM, which is going between the reset state, okay? Uh, start condition, Send data, acknowledge, prep for stop, and stop condition. Okay, reset, start condition, send data, acknowledge, stop condition. And next time I'll cover this, next lecture, after lab, I'll cover this in more detail. Okay? Is that clear? Good question. Okay? So the ROM, if you notice, I'll show you how to do the ROM. The ROM needs a clock, right? He's doing the master level clock for the 50 megahertz. However, the ROM controller that's incrementing uh, from one address to the next should go only on the I squared C clock, yes? Great question, right? Make sense? Because you need to make sure your ROM data is ready really quickly, yes? Okay? So let's look at the ROM controller. So the ROM controller instantiates a ROM, okay? ROM one port memory module from MegaWizard, okay? So if you go into the tools, this is how you create a ROM. Go to MegaWizard, let me create one, I'm not gonna save it, all right? So create, where do you think is the ROM here? Huh? I don't see memory. Where's Memory compiler, okay. So which one do you choose? One port, all right, you have only a single read-write port, okay. You're actually gonna read, you're not writing anything to it. That's why it's called ROM, okay. So let's just call it, I don't know, uh, I squared C ROM. Uh, this is test I squared C ROM. I don't wanna rewrite, uh, or I don't wanna overwrite Collins' work, okay. Next. some time unfortunately mine takes time okay how wide should the Q output bus be how many bits is coming out 24 yes why is it one no you take that's a good point right the way Colin's doing it which makes sense is he sends he gets a data packet out, his master FSM, his control FSM, gets one data packet out, and then it clocks it sequentially out. So he uses a shift register to send it out. Is that clear? Uh, let's see. What should the memory block type be? You should leave it at all. You can, oh, wait. How many 24 bits of, 24 bit words of memory do I have? 10. Okay, I don't know if you can do 10. You can only do powers of two, for obvious reasons. I don't, yeah, I don't think you can do 10. No, you can't, right? So 
So 32, notice you have five bits of address, okay? Because you need five address bits to store 32 locations, yes? That's fine. You're just not gonna, you're not gonna use um, 22 of the 32 locations. Okay. There it is. Huh? You can't, because that's uh, with 10 words. It, it, on this FPGA, it just doesn't work in the sense, um, let's see. Uh, the minimum you can do is 32, so why do you care? Right? You just can't. It's not a deal breaker. So go to next. How should the port, which port should be registered? Yeah, Q want to be registered with the clock. All right. Do you want to specify the initial content of the memory? Yes. You already know what's going to be in your memory. Exactly this, all right? There are two ways to specify memory contents. One is a hex file, or the other is a MIF file, memory initialization file. I'm gonna use a MIF file, right? So to do that, you can use a hexadecimal or a memory, initial, memory initialization file now. So this is a good thing I'm doing this. I forgot before creating the ROM, you need to create a MIF file, so hit cancel, right? Let me go back in here and show you how to create the MIF file. Whoops file, new, memory initialization file, okay, hit okay, number of words is how many, 32, yes, what is the word size, 24, okay, now something about these stupid MIF files, this, I believe you cannot put hex, you can only put unsigned decimal, okay, so if you notice in this comment here, Note that MIF file content is specified in hence decimal, hence MIF data corresponding to this hex bit stream is this. How did I figure this out? Use Windows Calculator. That's what this is the only useful thing about this. Right? So go to view, uh, programmer, uh, let's see, hex, just be really careful, all right? 34001A decimal, you see that? Okay? I could I can try specifying it in uh, hex. I don't think it'll work. If somebody figures out how to write hex here, let me know. Oh, must be a radix unsigned decimal. So just paste. Okay. Boom. All right. So fill in ten locations, zero through nine. Is that clear? And then save this MIF file. It'll get added to the project. And if you notice, Colin already has this. not here. I'm sure it's in here. Yeah, here it is. I squared C ROM dot MIF. Okay. Okay. So when you create your ROM, it'll ask you what MIF file to use. So create the MIF file first and then add it to the codec ROM and you can see. Oh, it's interesting. So what Colin has done is he's not using his 50 megahertz clock. He's always enabled the ROM. You can do that as well, right? Like you really don't need to clock the ROM, right? Clock in is, uh, no, actually, no, what am I saying? I'm on, I'm on crack. So, yeah, he does have, a, yeah. The ROM, I take back what I said, right? This is, it's, I'm really hungry. I haven't had lunch. So I can't think. So this is just this is nonsense, what I just said, right? Don't ignore that. That the initialization is just what Cordis does. But here is a codec ROM instance, and he does use a 50 megahertz clock. That's what your ROM will not work unless there's a clock, right? So in other words, when you give it an address and ask for the data, it looks at the rising edge of the clock. Remember the mega wizard? It put registers, right? The registers are flip-flops. What am I saying? What are you? Here it is. Okay, so we're running out of time. We'll continue this next uh, class, but what are you gonna do for lab tomorrow? So for that, uh, let's go into your little syllabus. I heard something like, I'm not sure. What are you talking about? What are you not sure about? Yeah, yeah, that's just initialization, yeah. I mean, that's not initial. Okay, look. 
remember that uh, mega wizard it creates like all these ip files right so you to uh, instantiate where is your Chrome, man no it's not it's just so if you go into the codec rom remember you take this entity from here you copy it so it's in here okay you, you just copy it so just, they, remember you should never rely on this right it's just it's, you can't say it's for model sim. I mean, model sim will use it, but in a physical design, all your initializations are done in a well-defined reset state. This means nothing to the synthesizer. Okay. So there, good, good. You asked that question. So let's look at the syllabus, right? Good job. So we're in week seven. So we're gonna next. So you're gonna basically gonna do checkpoint one. Okay. Your checkpoint one is due next week. Okay. Yeah. You should be working because the idea is your delay counter should be wrapped up by this week. If not, I'm not going to take off points. But if you don't wrap it up by this week, you cannot finish the checkpoint one by next week, right? So work on it. So we'll continue talking about it, all right? Again, you should not struggle. So by tomorrow, you should be ready with this and this, okay? So boom, it should, be, it should be ready. The ROM controller should be done. The final thing left is this data bit counter and this master FSM, and we'll talk about it in the next lecture. And then you go work on it, right? For one week. That's, that's the way this works, right? So yeah, that's about it. So yeah, I'll post this lecture online.